Okay, Ooh, that's loud. This one's a lot louder. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. If you wanna go ahead and find a seat, grab a beer. Very excited to have George Lee here today. He's a co-founder of We Trust. And he'll, he'll go into more detail what that is, but it's just a really neat opportunity to get social good using Bitcoin technology. But with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to George. Uh, round of applause, please. All right. And then we'll talk more about the team and, and stuff like that pretty soon. So um, before we jump into WeTrust, I want to set the stage in context of uh, the current situation of the financial industry and what decentralized financial products could mean um, so that we get kind of understand why we create this. So right now, we believe that there's, in some cases, misaligned interest between financial institutions and their customers. For example, you need a loan, you need to have good credit, money, etc. The, the better you, the more you have of those things, the easier you can get a loan. So you're kind of in a catch point too. Um, insurance, you pay your insurance premiums month after month, but when it comes time to a claim uh, because you got into a legitimate accident, it could become a very difficult because there's a direct conflict of interest between uh, the insurance company's profits and your ability to get that claim. Uh, because they need to pay a lot in advertising, um, bureaucracy, just really regular operational expenses. Um, so it's, it's challenging. In addition, something that you may have no noticed as a customer of banks or insurance companies is the product doesn't vary too much. But in most industries, in those kinds of situations, the margins usually decline to near zero, such as in auto or manufacturing. And yet, the margins oftentimes are pretty healthy. Now, why is that? It's because the product that they're selling is not necessarily just the insurance or the banking experience, it's the, their, their service, their role as a trusted third party. And that's a very important one. We're very fortunate here in the Western and developed worlds that there is this service. But in many other countries, this does not exist. And so they rely on an alternative. And Let's talk more about that. Um, they rely on something called social capital and trust networks in the, in the context of a financial world. So what does that exactly mean? So before we get into that, let's just talk about kind of Bitcoin and decentralization, because it's Bitcoin data. So in our view, Bitcoin is decentralized money. However, we, with decentralized money, you can't really capture the promise of distributed systems and decentralization if you can't have financial products and services. So that's our goal, is to try to create decentralized financial products so you can take advantage of decentralized money the same way you would uh, with very regular banking services. So our vision is to create a platform that enables lending and insurance circles that are powered by social capital, trust networks, and blockchain. So one of our first products, the first product that we're building is called the Lending Circle. Uh, it's also known as ROSCA, or Rotating Savings and Credit Association in the United States. And what it is, uh, before, we, before we go into what it is, it's this huge market. Uh, it's used in India, Latin America, Mexico, China, and it's very, um, and, and among immigrant groups in the United States. So I'll give an example of what a Lending Circle is. So typically, it's a group of people who trust each other. They know each other either through family or work, different kinds of situations. They agree on a fixed contribution at a fixed frequency. So in this example, it's $10 per month. Adam, Bill, Carl, and Diane, they put in $10, so there's $40 pot. And they agree, before participating in this, the rules of how that money is redistributed. In some cases, they agree to determine the sequence. So month one, Adam gets it, month two, Carl gets it, and so forth. In other groups, um, it's a voting process each round based on whoever needs the money most. In other groups, and this varies by region of the world and culture um, and just the type of group you want to create, some groups they do it by an auction. So it's a purely supply and uh, market-driven force. 
because sometimes maybe someone needs to invest money into their small business, or someone is in urgent need of insurance. Now, how do you really weigh that against each other? So what they do is a reverse auction. In this case, Adam gives $35. The remaining $5 is split evenly between the other participants. Now, the only rules of this scenario is that you can only win once every four times. So, you, so everyone gets their turn. If you continue saving, you contribute to the group, and you are you know, rewarded with, with something of a, a similar to interest, though so not, you know, technically not interest, because there's uh, the, the total is a, a zero, zero sum game, um, but you can think of it as interest. Now, why do people participate if it's a zero sum game? Well, it's essentially time shifting your access to money. If you're saving $10 a month by yourself, you get $40 at the end of four months. By participating in this, some people get that $40 the first month, some people get it the second month. And so, some people view economists say that the last person, they are basically in the same situation if they had tried to save $40 on their own, whereas other people can get access to credit a little bit sooner. It's also, people also participate in this because it's a source of economic security. It's, they use this and use this as a source of insurance. And some others use it as a source of opportunity so they can invest earlier, uh, so they don't have to save up four months to buy the car so they can go to work. Um, some other aspects of it is that interest stays in the community. Uh, it's very simple and easy to use. Um, many people that use this um, don't have to be um, literate to use this. The mechanics are very, very simple to use and model. And so we're, what we've done is created a proof of concept of modeling these mechanics. Um, you can, it, it's similar to, some people say it's similar to a DAO, but it's a very, very simple organization with very well-defined mechanics. So we created the MVP and it's deployed on Ethereum mainnet. It's fully functional. You can participate and invite friends. And we're gonna, sh how many people want to see a quick demo of that action? Okay, great. Um, so just to have a slight change of pace, um, one of our uh, front-end developers has created this very nice video. I'm Paul, I'm just taking you through great. Hello? I'm Tom and I'm going to be taking you through creating and participating in a Roscoe on a WeTrust decentralized application. So first things first, you can see that I've already logged in. Uh, you can see Roscoe's that I've hosted, joined, and been invited to. But we're going to create a new Roscoe. So here we're given the opportunity to enter many details about our Roscoe. So I'm going to call my birthdays because you know there are a few birthdays of my friends coming up. And uh, I'd like to be able to access some, some funds in the event that I don't quite have enough to, to get them present. So I'm going to enter one of them participant, um, and that's just going to be me as well. So in reality, you probably want to enter, you know, you have a few more participants than, than just one other person. Um, but right now, just for demonstration purposes, we're just going to have one other participant. And so the payment frequency is daily, that's just so we don't have to spend too much time waiting around. And then payment amount of five people. I'm going to set the start date for current future. Um, that's about the 11th of April, 10th of April. And I'm going to create this Roscoe. So right now, we're prompted to select an account with which to participate in the Roscoe. Uh, so every uh, participation transaction has to come from this account. If it doesn't come from this account, you won't actually be able to participate in the Roscoe. Um, so yeah, so we're going to select uh, this top account. And just to clarify, um, so this is fully functional in dissolving using Chrome, and then you can basically use the MetaMask extension, and then you can basically connect with the Ethereum blockchain. So now you can see our Roscoe has been created. I'm listed as a participant because I've created the Roscoe, and I'm also a full person. So I'm going to log out. I'm going to log back in um, as the uh, other user. And we can see that I've been invited to this Roscoe. So I'm going to click that, and I'm going to click join. And again, we're prompted to select an account to participate in the Roscoe. So I'm going to select account two. There we go. Now I'm going to log back in as the full person. And I'm going to 
why this rust comes because I'm happy with the details. So there we go, the contract's being deployed. And if we wait a couple of minutes, our law school will be ready. We all have to wait for minutes. And there we go. We can see that the contract has been verified by Weetress. Now what this actually means is um, the, the, the data that was submitted with the transaction which deploys the contract, um, we, we check that data uh, using this contract address. We check that and we make sure that it matches the uh, compiled bytecode um, for our Rosco contract. So this, uh, this link will take you to the respective contract on Etherscan. It won't actually work for me because I'm using uh, a local blockchain. So now if I fast forward my blockchain's time to so after the start date, uh, which was the 10th of April, then I should be able to start the Rosco. So now we can see that it's, uh, it's starting. And if we just wait a couple of minutes and then hit refresh, our Rosco is good. So we're currently in the first round. Um, we have no participants up to date yet because nobody's contributed, obviously no bid. And uh, here we can see the list of participants that are yet to contribute. So let's contribute. Now we have five ETH left to contribute this round, so let's just contribute at five ETH. So that will appear pretty soon. Um, and uh, we're just going to log out and log back in as well. There we go. We can see that our, our four person is up to date because they, their contribution has been registered. And if we scroll down, we can see that on the round of that block. And in this table. Uh, we're, yet to we're yet to contribute, so let's do that. Let's contribute by default. Uh, if we wait a couple of minutes and then hit refresh, we should be able to see that uh, we also jump up into that participants up to date row. And uh, we should also be able to submit a bid. Uh, there we go. So now we can submit a bid on this round of the Rosco. Uh, it tells us we can submit a bid up to 10 Ether because that's going to be the maximum value of the pot uh, for the users' contributions. Um, but we really want to win this round. So we're going to submit a bid of 9 Ether. That means we're going to forego 1 Ether of the pot and receive um, a minimum of 9. So let's bid. Now it will be registered fairly soon. Refresh a couple of times, and there we go. We can see that we're the lowest bidder, we're the bidder behind the So let's log back in as a fourth person. And let's advance the round of the Roscoe. Now, in reality, you wouldn't be able to advance uh, the round of the Roscoe until you'd actually got past this. Um, it's uh, round end date. But because uh, this is just a test and a demonstration, we've just made this next round button available all the time. So let's hit next round. Refresh. There we go. We should be able to see we're in round two. And we should be able to see that in round one, our winner was our other participant, and they won nine either. And we can see uh, the event log, two contributions of 5 ether, a bit of 9 ether, and then the funds released uh, to this user. 9 ether in total. Um, we can see that our fourth person also won some, um, some ether in that round. And you might be wondering why that is. Well, that's because the one ether that this uh, participant chose to forego was split and distributed evenly between the two participants. So uh, now both participants have some balance that they can withdraw if they want to. And um, yeah, that's pretty much how you participate in a Roscoe through WeTrust. Um, I hope that was informative. And uh, I hope you guys are looking forward to uh, actually participating in some Roscoe. Yeah, so uh, I really like that video because I really like his voice. Um, <laughs> yes, please do um, and something I want to continually emphasize is one of the feedback that we get from everyone is, okay, so why would you, what if they just contribute and they win and they run away, right? And I want to continue to emphasize is that this is, 
to be, this is participating, people are participating in these with friends, and people they know and trust. So there is social kind of a relationship between that, that there is something to lose. It might not be monetary value, but they do have something to lose it. And blockchain, in my view, is technology that serves a purpose, and it has value. However, I feel that we, at least we are not divorcing that from reality, which is anything peer-to-peer, -peer, whether it's you're paying someone or, or any interaction, still has social trust involved. Whether you're going to the store, that around the corner to buy the bakery, that you're, you're trusting that this is, this is you know, um, good, it's not expired, and so forth. So there is always that element of social trust, and I feel like it's going to, we should not divorce ourselves from reality. Um, just want to emphasize that. Now going back to the MVP, we have uh, had the code reviewed by Open Zeppelin. I think they're one of the top uh, security review companies, and they actually published an article today uh, saying this was one of the most well-written contracts that they've audited. Um, you can check out their full review on the blog. Uh, check it out. Now many people also ask, uh, so what's is this? Is this it? What's next? We, we think Lightning Circles is a foundational product, uh, and we're starting with that because it has inherent, uh, it's, a, it's an overused term, but network effects, because you can't use this on your own. Um, you're going to use this with people you know, and by virtue of that, you would invite people that you know to join you to use this product. Um, in addition, so, so, so that we, we want to use as a way to spread and, and uh, get users. And then in the future, you can build other products on top of that, because once you have the social graph of trust, we can understand, uh, we can build additional financial products on top of that. Um, just to, uh, uh, we didn't get a chance to introduce ourselves, but uh, myself, before doing this, I started another company called Cotton Group, and before that, I worked at uh, Google and McKinsey. Um, Patrick, who's also here today, he uh, worked at EY, and he has a CPA and a UC Berkeley graduate. Um, Ron is our platform architect, uh, who is a tech lead at Google uh, as a software tech lead for about seven years. And Tom Nash uh, is based in the UK. Uh, China is based in the Area as well, and they're um, also really strong developers on our team. Um, one of these is our advisors, uh, Yimin Boon, uh, we've worked very closely with, especially because the DAO has written quite a bit about the hack and it's near and dear to his heart. Um, we feel that what we're creating is a very, very simple version of the DAO. Um, and we need to start simple because otherwise there are a lot of security issues and challenges um, that can be encountered if you jump too far all at once. So we've been working closely with him. Um, Bo Shen and Vitalik uh, have also been uh, early supporters of this project to basically use blockchain to do more than just gambling, but also do social good and things that are useful to, to everyday people. Um, we're working with Benedict. He's uh, a platform lead at BitGo, uh, the wallet company. And then Brian Hoffman um, we're, is going to be very helpful because what we're building is completely decentralized. When you create a lending circle with your friends, we you don't have the ability to touch your funds. And so he has a lot of experience building uh, open platforms, um, and we are talking about how to monetize in this situation, um, how to build value-added services uh, when you're doing everything open source. Um, so we've been uh, covered in, in several media outlets, and uh, some of you might know, um, the class that was supposed to start uh, March 1st, 12 a.m. GMT, which is 4 p.m. local time, um, but we had to push it out to tomorrow by 24 hours uh, because the AWS <coughs> situation um, caused a lot of problems. Coinbase, UNAPS was down, and uh, we just thought it would be better just to not deal with the uncertainty uh, and let that kind of calm down for a little bit. Um, so that's what we have as a presentation. I don't want to spend too much time talking. Um, I want to open it up to Q&A. Um, before we do that, here's all the contact information and where you can learn more about us, the Slack channel, our blog, and uh, 
Yeah, we'll open up to questions. All right, so I'll walk around the microphone. Uh, I did have one quick question we can start with. Can you tell us more about the crowd sale? Um, so the crowd sale, so up, to, up until now, we've been um, self-funded. Uh, and the crowd sale, we are planning to basically raise funds to continue the effort to build out the, the trusted lending circle, build out more features. Uh, some of the features that are very critical are the, in the integration of stable coins and other types of tokens so that you don't have to just use Ether. Um, working with other NGOs to first in the US to gain adoption and gain users and then working with NGOs that are global to, because these are you know, Gates Foundation, Oxfam, these organizations are facilitating lots of all around the world and we want to position ourselves first as a tool uh, that can help automate, uh, make it secure, and, and um, digitize a lot of these cash transactions so that they can be you know, more, more products that are built on top of this. Um, through that, I think we'll be able to build a better reputation uh, with people, uh, the average user, who might not, who, who, who have never heard of us before. But we can partner uh, with an established organization that's been on the ground for years and years that would really help us. And so, the crowdfunding's purpose is to help us build out the product and engage with NGOs, uh, customers, and so forth. If you use Ethereum and other, potentially other tokens on your platform, what is it that you're selling on the crowd sale? What is the... What are you selling specifically in the crowd sale if you don't have the native token that's required? Yes, yeah, so network? there will be a native token, um, it's called TrustCoin, and basically there are fees on the platform and any fees that are on the platform will be represented by the trust point. Um, so to give an example, in that lending circle that we talked about, usually in every group, there's someone who acts like the glue of, of that circle of friends. And in some societies, they don't get paid anything, but in many, they are paid like a 1% or 3% or 5% fee for their services. Uh, knocking on doors, reminding people, and being kind of a well-respected person in the community. And so when they earn any fees on this platform, it will be in the form of you know, trust funds. I, I wanted to ask a similar question. So the token you are selling is, is a token that, that they can use to pay the platform fees once it will be developed, so it's not share or company or something. That's correct. Um, it'll be basically uh, representing all the fees that are paid by the people who benefit from this trust, of the network of trust, to the people who facilitate trust. Um, in addition, there are cases where um, you may need to, when you're in a circle, like say they say that Joe or everyone needs to put down some collateral in case of uh, wrongdoing. Right, and so anything like that would also be in the form of uh, trust point. Okay, so as an investor, how can I, uh, how can I evaluate the like, percentage of the company or value that I am buying by participating in the crowd sale? Yeah, so this is not a uh, selling of any portion of the company. Um, this is solely um, you know, funding the effort to build out a product that I believe, that many of us believe will benefit the overall ecosystem, uh, the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, and so I would not view this as any... But how can I calculate the return of investment? Like in a year? Yeah, I believe that would be very difficult. So how do I know that what I'm buying will not cost one cent? I would not evaluate it in, in those terms. Um, we are actually uh, part of a nonprofit organization to build out software um, for the sake of advancing and you know, solving the problems associated with financial inclusion. Um, so I would definitely uh, not view it in investment terms. <coughs> yeah. Okay, next. Yeah. Um, question, so who is the target market? I guess um, people participating in that are the country where it's a bit harder and they don't have access to technology. Um, so how do you address that? 
Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So in the beginning, um, right now, as the product is, it's very obviously you, know, you need to have Ether, you need to use MetaMask to incorporate, right? Um, but it's just a concept at this point. Um, we will work hard to make this easier to use, uh, both in terms of not requiring people to know about blockchain technology, not requiring people to own things like Ether, um, and there's many things that we need to do and partner with other organizations to overcome that. Um, but our first market would be working with NGOs with people who are already participating in these kinds of lending circles because uh, behavioral change is even more difficult to overcome than technological change. Um, many people in the US, they do not want to mix money with their friends and family. Um, so that is a hurdle that, you know, it's very difficult to address. So we will take this on the approach of a technology point of view, how to make it easier so that people who are already using this can use it more. By the way, Pat, you can do a really good job. Um, Hi. Um, so a quick question. In the presentation, um, in the beginning, you mentioned um, decentralized money. So in this case, it seems like so basically the lending is happening between circles of people rather than a central institution, correct? Right? Exactly. And, um, and we trust is sitting kind of as the community glue that glue these people together. Instead of them just like, you know, random circle talking to each other. Kind of. And is this, this concept, is it only going to be pertained to the Ethereum platform or are we going to look for expansion into other platforms as well? Yeah, that's, uh, so right now, um, we have thought about building in, in other kind of platforms, but as of right now, Ethereum is the most mature. Um, but we are ultimately blockchain agnostic, so that we could use any uh, EVM compatible. So, because you have a native token that's based in Ethereum, right? So once you build the network effect into Ethereum, how do you, how do you say, migrate if you open up to another platform, how do you migrate that network to another blockchain? Yeah, I think that's going to be... Because that's in terms of distribution. Yeah. Well, I'm asking this question because like, I'm, I'm, I've been looking at the interest in the concept, but I just want to know how do you, what is your plan for distribution? Because the gentleman earlier asked the target clearly to be seen in you know, people in third country without much technological access. But at the same time, it seems like it requires quite some technological understanding in the first place to use it. So, so these are just how do you, what is your plan for distribution for mass adoption, and how do you plan to make it easier to, for the normal average Joe to use in order to access this decentralized financial product? Yeah, so there's a lot of other projects ongoing. Um, for example, status.im is to make this visible on mobile phones. Um, that's just one example. Um, there's uh, MakerDAO and Stable that are working on the fiat token that's basically just all around the blockchain. Um, and there's many other efforts ongoing that will basically we're, we're in talks with Digix DAO. They have a gold token, right? So there are many things that are going on in parallel that we will need to incorporate. Um, as far as technological access, um, I think. Um, it is often the case where we think about technology through our lens. Um, it's very interesting to see places like Kenya, where they have mass adoption of digital currency like M-Pesa, 70% uh, usage, um, 30 or 40% of GDP actually flows through this digital currency. Um, of course, it's very easy to use, right? So um, that's the number one challenge. Um, but I think we work with the other people in the ecosystem um, it's surmountable. It may take time, but uh, it's we're still early days. But I think um, there's a lot of people. Hey, George. Hey. So with the with the token offering kind of on the horizon, I'm just wondering if you can offer a little transparency into how your advisors are being compensated. With the token house sale on the horizon, you said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so some people are just helping because they see this as good for the ecosystem. Um, they're just, uh, they just see this as adding value to the overall ecosystem. 
and that is a huge compensation, right? If it can help uh, really integrate uh, Uport, right, uh, which is a great identity type of product, if we can help integrate Repsys and DigixDAO and all these other different products that are built on the platform, that would be good for, for all participants in the community. Um, other folks are early investors or early supporters um, in this project, um, and, and they're you know, compensated with a percent of the tokens uh, that are allocated to the team right now. So a percent of, of that they you know, contributed. And what, what percentage is allocated to the team and maybe what's the Oh, yeah. So, so overall, the mechanics of the crowd sale, 80% um, are going to be issued through the crowd sale. Of the remaining 20%, 10% is for the team and advisors. The remaining 10% is for um, future expenses uh, for the organization, the down team, and so forth. And, potentially hiring more people down there. So uh, you mentioned investment. Okay, yeah. In general, these, you know, underbanked economies, the, you know, the telcos are the glue. Yeah. So uh, you haven't mentioned really working with the telco, you work, you're talking about NGOs. The reality is the telcos are the banking system in a lot of these countries. And any UI that doesn't work on the feature phone that they have on those networks probably won't get anywhere. No matter how simple you make the app, if it has to run on a significant processor on Chrome or something like that, there's really no possibility of that working. And certainly in rural India or something like that. So what have you done to actually establish relationships with the telcos themselves? Yeah, I think um, the internet, internet use or, or, or phone, cell phone usage in general, um, feature phone usage in general, um, used to be zero. Um, and now, even in these rural areas, uh, the penetration or usage of feature phones has, is, you know, people don't have electricity, don't have water, but they, they bring their phones to the local kind of electricity hub to, to charge up, right? So the cell phone has been such a critical part. Um, and right now we're also seeing trends of smartphone adoption um, that is growing rapidly because Android phones are becoming cheaper and cheaper. And so while we're not there right now, um, I think the trend shows that by 2020, 40% um, no, of many of these people in rural communities will also have access. Now having said that, um, I think we will need to explore because there are, there are potential synergies or benefits of working with these telcos, um, whether it's white labeling this, this product so that they can use it. Um, so, but to be honest, we haven't you know, explored the telco world that much. Um, what we do know is the, the, the one billion users who use these types of plus lending circles is, is, uh, is very uh, diverse. So a lot of my coworkers from Google and McKinsey in India, uh, they still participate in these type of organizations despite having access to banking, despite being very tech, tech savvy. Um, so we'll probably focus more on that segment of, of people who choose to use these types of financial products despite having alternatives, simply because it's a more competitive product. They can get loans at a better rate, they can save at a better rate. Uh, and then through time, we hope that smartphone adoption will also I want to encourage you to think about ways to make the telcos your friends. As a, you know, if they're going into a business that you're about to gut, they probably will not be friends. So, uh, might be worth looking think about that sooner rather than later. Thank you for your advice. Right, thanks, Josh. That was an amazing talk. Um, just really quickly, so you mentioned social value was the incentive to keep people maintaining their muscular, basically, in the contribution circle. Given that, how do you verify that when people join Roskers, they're only joining people they know? And how do you ensure like scam artists and things like that don't just publish like public Roskers on like the Bitcoin talk forums and stuff like that, and then random people just join and then they get scammed? So stuff like that. Yeah, that's uh, um, the potential for that for people to uh, maybe swindle people who are who are uh, 
thinking that they can make a lot of money from this, right, or people impersonating others. I think um, those are both challenges uh, that we're talking, which are speaking to our advisors about. Um, so how do you create, so that's where identity uh, could be a more and more important piece in this puzzle. Um, in a very base case, when you were to receive an invitation from your friends, you, you go into this circle and you see, do I know all these emails? Are they familiar? I go call them, I talk to them, hey, did you invite me to this? Right, those are kind of the very basic ways to write it. Are they that, hey, uh, you're participating with known people? Um, but I think uh, other ways might be to allow the tethering of other social media profiles. Um, but I think this is one of the challenges that Uport is working on, and it's uh, the, the project under consensus. Um, they've made quite a bit of headway. We've actually had some conversations with them uh, where this could be a very early, this could be a place where we can collaborate on um, for and it could be beneficial in many ways. Thank you. Base business model. I admit there's a there's a part that I'm missing about the base kind of how it works in real life. So the idea is I've got uh, I'm a part of let's say a group of five people. I'm asking. So I'm a part of a group of five people. Let's say I've got ten dollars a month I'm earning, or out of the or out of the money, money, amount of money I'm earning, I've got ten dollars a month that I can devote to this process, per, or ten dollars per pay, per period. Yeah. Um, so everybody, all all five of the people put that money in. There's fifty dollars in the pool. And then there's this reverse bidding process. Somebody wins from that. What it, then what happens after that? I, if I've won that process, let's say with $45 bid, um, now I've got a payment, a repayment term, an interest rate, and I've got a term to repay, which I assume is pretty short. Yeah, so let's say, uh, just to play, go along with your example, it's uh, five people, $10 a month. So the agreement, the, the payment terms have already been agreed. Like how you pay back is the same for everyone, no matter how much you borrow. Um, so your payment term is $10 a month. Everyone agreed to pay $10 a month for the next five months. Now, when you receive that initial, I guess, pot, is based on how soon you need it, or how badly you need it. Um, and the interest rate is based on how much you bid, if I could on the interest rate. Um, so if you're a saver, you never bid, you just win the whole pot at the end, right? Because you have no, there's no one bidding, you just take the whole pot. And you, maybe cut this some fees along the way. Now, if you win the first time, no matter how, you, how much you take from that pot, you're still committed to pay $10 every month. Okay, so the amount, so, uh, so I win at $45, the next month I'm committed to put in 10, yeah. and everybody else puts in 10 again? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, so, but I don't try to put in more than 10, because I would normally put in 10, but I also won last, the last month's pot. Because at the end of the five periods, you would have paid back the full 50, and you would have, kind of uh, lost $5 in a sense to, to the other participants for the, for, the, for the privilege of using a derivative than other people. Um, so some people, some people or, or cultures think about this in, as an analog to insurance. By right? insurance, you pay a fixed amount every month, no matter what. Right? And even after you have an accident, you continue paying. Um, and, and even if you don't have an accident, so it's, it's analogous to that in some sense. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Joe. Another question. Um, so the whole model of this product, I think, is great. But um, given the other gentleman's issue with you know the whole target audience that you're going for, have you guys ever considered looking at the whole market, especially towards like millennials, towards gaming, especially with the rise of gaming assets on the Ethereum blockchain, where this lending, you know, product could actually be used by like kids and things like that. I think I think that would actually have a much like gamifying but also gamifying the user experience where this whole thing becomes like a platform in its own social network that's built on a platform. And then you'll have much more value, I think. And that's something I would be interested in using it. A lot of people would be interested in it. Rather than trying to target, the, I mean, the third world country would be more important too, right? But 
you're gonna have yeah. to like make money first. And I don't know how you're gonna make money. You're gonna end up spending probably a lot of money before you can start to get some adoption there. Just saying. But yeah, yeah, that's, that's um, I think the messaging would be the, the key part, right? When we talk about like a trusted lending club or in these terms, it may be very foreign to people who grew up, like myself in the US, where people don't interact with friends with, with lending, right? But if we can position it as something more of a, and, and I think Pat has a good example of where um, poker players, they have, or any type of prof profession that has volatility in their income, right? They might, um, these are professional poker players, they form groups where if one person has a down day, other people contribute so they can kind of recover and then they do that for each other in a reciprocal way, right? And these things exist. Um, so I think there are ways where we can position this and message this as something that is more uh, culturally acceptable. The gaming, the gaming sector is like, it's like half a trillion dollars and they're growing to like 6% of it. It's under the market. Okay, then we should, uh, yeah, we should definitely talk more after this too. I think there's, and many people, when they, when, Anyone who hears about this, they have a different reaction. They say, oh, this is just like X, or this is just like Y. Like, we talked to uh, a friend in Hong Kong, and they've been in the shipping industry. And they, the way they do P&I insurance is, you know, 10 shippers would all put in funds, and then occasionally a ship has problems or, or whatnot, and they, the person, I mean, it's all verifiable, so whoever has a problem, once in a year type of issue, or a very rare type of issue, they can get access to those funds. And this is another example where you can use this where you pay in uh, by default, and you draw out uh, by exception, right? So there are, and, and we're building a platform right now to, to um, and we hope that this can be used for other purposes in the future. Um, so that's definitely something we're, we're looking at. Uh, two quick things uh, on the <coughs> demo. I think the idea was that the, whoever gets paid out, whatever's left, gets split amongst the other participants, right? Yes. And the demo looked like the leftover dollar got split between the two participants, one of which won. Yes. Uh, was that just by the nature of the setup of the demo, or is? Yeah. So uh, technically, um, you could, you would do it. Um, between the people who actually did not receive the pot, I mean, it's just kind of duplicating. Um, but it's a way more efficient from a smart contract language uh, on the Ethereum platform right now. Um, we may or may not fix that. It's not really a bug. Um, you can just think of that uh, distribution of the delta as uh, some of that goes to yourself. Um, so the way we would represent that in the future is probably just say, how much do you want to bid uh, as a kind of a effective interest rate, yeah. right? And then it would just account for all the distributions. Okay, and then uh, second, the, the trust point, it's sound you said you earn it, uh, the more you stay in, I guess, the more capital you're kind of providing. Is there any other positive value to having that for future rounds, any other uh, plan benefits for the coin? So right now, um, and in the future, our platform, well, right now it accepts Ether as the token of value. In the future, we want to allow usage of, of um, other tokens. Um, and on those platforms, we are thinking about, we'll, we'll likely charge some kind of fee um, on distributions. Now, if you were to use the trust point that we issue as the default token of value, we would have significantly less fees. So there would be some incentives to use the native token. Um, in addition, we're also thinking about other value-added services on top of this base case. Um, for example, vouching or loan guarantees or collateral. <coughs> These other types of um, kind of digital assets, there will be incentive to use trust points, although we will probably not you know, force you to use it um, for the sake of could the could the government ever come and say that this is interest? You're earning interest, so that it should be taxed. Yeah. So we we have um, we've <coughs> uh, some lawyers 
for lawyers with uh, a lot of fintech experience and uh, just general financial experience. And uh, we're making sure everything is done uh, correctly. If the government is going to tax it, then a lot of people might not participate, right? So, yeah, so we're making, so in the case of uh, Rotating Savings and Credit Association, um, from the research that we've done and the lawyers we've spoken to, um, it's treated very differently compared to, say, peer to peer lending. Um, that's why we see very few companies like Lending Club and Prosper, whereas there are other kind of Rosca type that do exist. But um, yeah, we're, we're staying in touch and we're making sure that everything's done uh, correctly. Hey, so speaking of lawyers, would you provide a framework for participants to sort of enter into agreement with one another? Yes, I forgot to mention that. So, you know, one of the top questions people ask us is about how, what if someone runs away into the <coughs> So the first layer is the social reputation and social capital aspect. But you know, I think many people point out correctly, if there is a large enough money at stake, or if someone is at dire enough straits, they can still choose to sacrifice their social reputation. And so our second line of defense is to create um, standard legal documentation created for certain jurisdictions where all the participants can digitally sign and say, in a templatized form, this is what we agree to, $10 every month, or five months, or until we decide to end it. And these can then uh, be used by the group in case of uh, wrongdoing by one of the individuals. Um, and then a third line of events would be some form of uh, collateral, allowing people to tie a digital asset or maybe a physical asset, um, some kind of promise uh, in case of uh, inability to fulfill this agreement. Um, lastly, in many places of the world, uh, uh, we're not as fortunate as here where we have rule of law, um, many places don't have very good rule of law, in which case um, one of our advisors suggested that there could be a bounty program where you could verify and validate that these are all legitimate legal contracts and there would be a third party bill collector or a collections agency that could be uh, that could buy this on 50 cents on a dollar so that people can recover this. Um, of course, those are become more and more complex in nature, um, and we'll start now with the simpler ones, uh, and then build out the legal documentation, collateral, and so forth. Uh, I got one question, but to be split into two areas. Uh, yeah. uh, one is, uh, basically, what are your threats? So, I'm especially interested in like, uh, government regulations because lending, online lending, were not regulated before. But with the new government, and many things can change. So, what do you foresee? Yeah, so the, the other one is the copycat. The digital the copycat your technology. Okay, so as far as the um, government, um, I think uh, we've spoken to people uh, from uh, different governments across the world. And uh, shadow banking is a big, big industry right now. And if anything, they would want, they, they want to see some of that shadow banking digitized so that they can see what's going on. And so there is, I think, a lot of curiosity in seeing how this can help um, transition or onboard people from the shadow banking industry to a more formal banking industry. And by having accounts and, and information and uh, the, the social graph, we can help them create a um, safer environment. Um, for example, Mission Asset Fund based in San Francisco, they're working with immigrants in the US and creating these lending circles and sharing this, and this you know, all transparent participants know, is being shared with banks like Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and it helps them onboard into the, the, the real uh, traditional financial industry. So I think, um, we should not see these things as either or or black or white, that there are uh, good opportunities to collaborate um, and ultimately bring, bring more value because when people are running and participating in these social circles, it helps them economically. 
right? And that's great for banks because then they have more spending power, they can, you know, buy cars and houses, etc. Et so it's great. Um, on the end, on the front of um, this thing being open source, um, that's one of the reasons we have um, open, why Brian Hoffman joined and he was really passionate about this because Open Bazaar is also open source. Um, they don't really make funds on on the platform aside from the value added services component. But what is going to be really helpful is the um, network effects. When we get people to use this, um, if we have a strong team and we continually build out a better product, then those would should be the reasons why they will continue using us rather than to, to use another platform. Hey. Um. Hello. Hey. Um, I'm, I'm an open system presentation, um, but you're uh, raising funds in Ether rather than your own token, is that right? Um, can you repeat that last part? Are you raising funds in Ether or your own token? We are, for the crowd sale, we will be accepting Ether and Bitcoin. Okay, cool. Um, and second question, have you have you practiced going through this process like with members on your team and friends and what are your biggest concerns around the operation of these lending circles? Is it user experience? Is it key management? Is it just orchestrating the right people to collaborate? What's, what's your biggest concern? So, do you have any ideas? Um, so I think, I'm happy to feel free to add, but I think for me, um, as someone who's not native to participating in these types of circles, um, I think a lot of it is habit, like getting into a habit of doing this on a weekly or monthly basis. Um, the other thing is, and, and I think that's just, yeah, I think that's probably the, one of the biggest hurdles, is um, how do you remember to do this? How do you... Um, and that's, no, no, what I had to do actually, I had to email people, hey, remind people, hey, you're late, or you have to do this. And I kind of felt, oh, I wish there was a way to do this more, like, less awkwardly, or more automatically, or have, a, have something that draws automatically. Um, because I think when you think about money and friends, and at least in the US, um, like Venmo has made it really easy to uh, have money involved with the people you know. Um, and it's pretty successful. And a lot of people use it. So I think ultimately it's, it's the user experience, making it as easy as possible. Um, it, it, it might be, and then that can overcome some of the cultural kind of uh, stigma around dealing with money and friends. That's, that's, all, that's what I have to say. Do you have anything else? I just wanted to say um, that the use case is also really important. Um, making sure that there's a very strong use case that people can benefit from it. And I think George alluded to earlier about um, the, the poker player, right? The poker player has volatile income. Right? They, they know they have a winning strategy. They're making money every month, but some months they're doing better than others. And a trader is a similar example, right? However, they know within a close group of friends, they all have a winning strategy, right? So how do they sort of mitigate that? How do they get more volume? How do they have more trades done? So these groups of people, right, and the, these people are also people that are accustomed to the volatility of Bitcoin or Ether. Right? So they could probably be comfortable with signing up for this, trying this out, and seeing that, hey, it's so much better than just keeping track of it on their phone or a text message group, right? Because now there's some accountability and um, everything is public. There's no hiding it, and you know, if, if one person actually doesn't pay back, then the rest of the group also sees that, so they lose some social capital there. And your example of the Oh yeah. So there's not, one of our um, other advisors said, if there's been a study done, right? If you're the only person in the restroom, and you know, maybe you're in a rush or something like that, 75% of people, only 75% of people wash their hands. Um, but if there's another person standing next to you, right, two people there, and you're in a rush, well, 99% of people now wash their hands. And the reason is because, you know, somebody else is looking over your shoulder, and you don't want to be seen as a you know, dirty person. So 
this is something similar, right? Everybody is watching you as you contribute every month, and you know, you're not gonna forget that 100 bucks, because if you forget, then, I mean, nobody wants to look like a dirty person, right? <laughs> So just a quick note, we'll do two more questions and then we'll, we'll go ahead and call. Um, can you talk about, you, you're a non-profit, right? didn't you say you're a non-profit? Yeah. Can you talk about that thought process? I'm just curious. Um, uh, that must have been a, like a, a, a pretty thoughtful choice and you could have made a commercial business out of it. What, why do you, just, I'm just curious that thought process. And uh, I mean, it's completely noble, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm just curious about the, uh, uh, the thought process. And then given that you went that way, how do you think about measuring your success? Um, I think uh, a lot of us were just you know, passionate about the topic of financial inclusion and how to use blockchain to address that. Um, I think there's going to be uh, the value that we're building this out is going to be uh, tremendous from a personal standpoint that we can um, use this in, in future endeavors um, if, if, if need be. Um, and as a nonprofit, you, you can still take a salary. So um, it's not like we won't be able to um, you know, be able to you know, be, be okay by right? paying rent and so forth. Yep. And I think if we can do that, um, that, that would be very uh, would be fun and it would be a great experience. Yeah. And uh, that both learning and especially. And in addition, uh, how we measure success, I think is ultimately how many users or how, how much this helps the overall ecosystem or elevate the, the level of discourse around blockchain um, to bring about you know, the, the discussion of how do we you know, use technology, but in reality, with the real world where people do interact with physical items and person to person. And smart contracts and technology can do quite a bit to automate and reduce the friction in many things, but um, social relationships still exist. So how do we use that in conjunction? Um, how, in the context of decentralization? Um, I think these are all very uh, interesting things that, that can be worked on. Just very quick follow-up. So, do you even? Uh, I'm asking because I, I actually I think that there's no reason to believe this wouldn't be a more common thing that people would choose to do in the future. In my opinion, you're working on a problem that is a, about making the world a better place. Ultimately, there's no reason that you couldn't choose to just do it purely for that reason as a nonprofit. So, somebody else asked about uh, competitive differentiators. Do you even care? Like maybe you said. Hey, if somebody else can do this in a better way, we don't care because we're just trying to be a change agent to make this happen. If we get 25% of that, you know, is on our platform, or 95% of it is on our platform, we don't care because we want to just drive the change. Yeah, I think uh, the results, right, after we build this, whether someone clones it, that means uh, it's almost a form of validation that this is something that's needed, right? Um, but I think uh, in terms of uh, success, right? How do you measure success? I think, uh, just like in social media, um, there, there were many, many different social networks, right? Um, but eventually there was one, or maybe there's a few, yeah. but basically Facebook. But um, I think if, if, if there's multiple platforms for maybe different regions or different purposes, um, I think another way to see success is to measure it is how versatile or, or how well can we build this product so that everyone will want to go maybe on top of this platform. Um, so, so we can build the rails so that you can create your purple, purple, purple circle where you, you know, help each other when someone is, has a down day or the gamer circle or the p and insurance situation. Um, maybe they can just take the components that we create and, and slightly modify it and still run on a platform. Um, so, so that could be a measure of how we, how we evaluate ourselves. So somebody asked, what's your biggest concern? And I was kind of surprised by your answer because I thought, if I were you, my biggest concern would be that, if I understand correctly how this is being used, at some point during every period, people are buying in, at some point, one person or some people are cashing out. 
And with every one of those, there's a conversion between some cash to Ethereum, whatever the currency that they're using in their circle is. So the, there's essentially a cost in, this, in buying and selling the cryptocurrency, which can't be done in every location, and might make the whole thing more expensive, even if you guys aren't charging any fees. It's, it, make, it adds an expense. Yeah, so that's definitely um, another angle of concern. Um, I think at least for our group, um, since we are we use like lower we use lower values or amounts, and also we're in the community in the crypto environment, we're not actively thinking about like converting it back to fiat. Like we're all okay with um, keeping some amounts in crypto. Um, I think I think that is a challenge in the future for the for the average person, right? How first the volatility. How do they get away from the swings? They don't want to deal with either. And then the on-ramp, off-ramps, how would we um, make that as low friction as possible? Presumably the only reason why somebody's gonna say, I'll take, I'll bid 35 for whatever other people are bidding 40 is because they need it. That means they're gonna be selling it for something to spend. I mean, it seems to me. Yeah, so, so that's definitely, um, the on-ramp and off-ramp, how do we make that as smooth as possible? So there's, you know, this is another area where there's companies who are dedicated to focus, um, dedicated on solving that part of the puzzle. And um, that's an area we want to work with them to see how can they, how can they do that easily. Yeah, I also, also want to add, um, I think the core competency of WeTrust is the creation of that smart contract, right? All that logic that you saw where there's a group of people that are able to securely gather together, and then there's some mechanism to distribute the fund. Right? That's our core competency. And I know, right, there are you know difficulties with fiat on and off ramp, but you know, there's you know that's the stable point problem. There's a bunch of companies trying to solve that. So and, and the access problem, right? Status, the whole company dedicated to solve that problem to get uh, the Ethereum blockchain onto your mobile phone. Right. So all, lots of these companies also running, and you know, we, we are focused on our own thing. Right, the smart contracts do all this grouping of trusted uh, networks, and then we're looking for partners, right, that are working on their respective uh, technologies using the blockchain, and then sort of meshing everybody together. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, George. That was very informative. Yep. Yeah, the Q&A section was very active, I like that. Uh, oh, yeah. So we're going to just do lightning talks really quick, and then we'll go ahead and break for more drinks and food. There's still pizza. I'm going to put some ice cream out. We got ice cream for free with our Instacart, so we have ice cream. First up, we have Dylan. He's going to be talking about a hackathon. Here you go. Yeah, so um, down the street from here, this place called Hack Reactor. It's a JavaScript boot camp. Um, so we're partnering with Purse and GenLife, which are two blockchain startups. We're running a uh, Bitcoin hackathon based on Bitcoin, which is Chris Jeffrey's uh, JavaScript full node implementation. It's going to be March 24th to March 26th. Um, you guys should check it out if you guys are interested. It's going to be a great opportunity, lots of great prizes. We have people from Purse and Lightning uh, and all the judges, and I think it's going to be really fun. So if you guys just Google Bitcoin hackathon, it'll be there. Um, you guys can also just talk to me afterwards. Thanks. Thank you, Dylan. Do I have a Jeremy? Yes. And so I have Jeremy with, uh, I do a bunch of things, but mainly with a group called FinTech Portfolio, which is itself an incubator uh, of FinTech startups. We do a few of those. I want to focus on two. Um, one is uh, FinTech School. Uh, we're developing a catalog of FinTech e-learning um, content, blockchain, payments, crowdfunding, lending, a uh, few other things. Uh, so we're looking for people who like teaching and uh, develop, in helping us build out that catalog. We've got a few ways that we're distributing that uh, to tell you about. The other thing is that we do some consulting, uh, FinTech Associates. Uh, if anybody uh, is blocked by growth issues and building out their uh, innovation ideas, either on the tech side or the finance side, we've got a team of people who are experienced in both. So come find me. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Andrei Zamalski, the CEO of MBSafe. We help companies to, to do the ICOs, uh, specifically to issue their financial instruments on Ethereum blockchain that typically represents a share, uh, shares of company or some other sort of contracts, like mining contracts. And we also help them uh, to get listed on the exchanges. So if anyone is interested in doing a crowd sale, talk to me. Hello everybody, many of you may have seen me before. I'm up here and I'm the only bar in San Francisco that takes Bitcoin. And uh, I'm now committed to keeping it in Bitcoin. So, come on by. It's Spooky's Club Modern, we're Bush and Taylor. It's a cocktail lounge that's uh, uh, based in the 1930s concept um, in terms of style. And we're at Bush and Taylor. And we're going to be doing a mixer, hopefully, in the next couple weeks. And so come on by. Stookies Club Modern. Yeah, it's a super nice bar. We've actually done uh, two or three events there already. And we're going to try to do another one in March. So it'll be in the newsletter. I'm going to send out in a couple of days if you're signed up for that on the meetup page. That's it. Thanks so much for coming out. We still have a bunch of pizza. Uh, I'm going to put the ice cream out. Since we had uh, more pizza than I expected, I'm going to, uh, if anyone wants to take a pizza, maybe walk up to somebody on the street who might need it, that'd be, that'd be appreciated if you guys want to help distribute what's left over. Thanks so much for coming out. I guess we got one last slide to talk. Bonus. Okay, um, I'm Shaban. I'm visiting from uh, Switzerland. Um, I'm the founder of Spells of Genesis. If some of you have heard of it, it's digital asset, game asset on blockchain, and we give back true ownership to players, and um, people are um, enjoying a lot, players are enjoying a lot, uh, owning the card, and then we build a real economy out of the Bitcoin blockchain. So I invite you, if you're interested in that uh, field, to talk uh, to us since we're here for Games Connection. All right, thank you. That's it, thank you so much.